og 27 kvinder. Welcome to the XC Top 5 show, which is now a competition that pits two washed up former varsity athletes turned journalists against each other in order to score meaningless points. I'm your host, Michael Doyle. Uh, and if you've been following what we've been doing at the XC over the last year, uh, you'll be familiar with the Top 5 podcast, which is each week. Andrew Cruikshank, Alex Sear, myself, we get together, we break down what we feel are the five most interesting or important or meaningful uh, stories in the world of running and track and field, of course, from the past week. Over the New Year's, we got together, we've decided to come up with a little bit of a resolution of sorts, and we've transformed the Top Five podcast into the Top Five show, which is going to be kind of like a competition show, a game show, if you will, all about running. So we're going to break down, again, what we feel are the top five stories of the week, but I will be judge, jury, and executioner, and Andrew and Alex uh, will be the contestants vying for points. And of course, I will also take them away if uh, the answers are lame. So... Alex Sear from the Red Island will be representing Team Red. Alex, potatoes or Anne of Green Gables, what is the more defining, iconic export from your home province of Prince Edward Island? I got to go with Anne because when someone eats a potato, they can rarely tell whether or not it's a PI potato, which sucks. And Good point. Anne... And to me is it's always surprising because when you grow up on PEI, you just think it's a really big thing on PEI. And then you go everywhere else and you realize that everyone knows what Anne Green Gable is. So she's, she's probably the most defining export. Yeah. Andrew Cruikshank, you'll be representing team blue. Of course you're wearing red. How convenient. Uh, Andrew, you're in Toronto. Very a very Toronto thing is I've got no question for you. Are you ready to win meaningless points? Always. <laughs> Excellent. So if you're listening to the podcast version of this, we're actually also doing a video, uh, which we'll be posting on YouTube regularly, as well as I think we're going to do IGTV also. Um, we're going to start creating a very regular schedule with this. Follow uh, us on Twitter at the XCORG in order to uh, get the itinerary as to how we're going to roll this out each week. Hopefully this will be a success and not an abject failure. Uh, if it is a success, let us know. If you think it's a failure, um, yeah, let us know as well. So how this is going to work? Quick breakdown. We're going to go through the five, top five stories. I've got some point, pointed questions for my panelists that I'm going to throw at them. They're going to give me their hottest take or their, their wisest insight into this story and I'm going to score them appropriately. At the end, we will declare a winner based on who's got the most number of points. What they win, they get to do a little victory lap. We're going to let them talk about something that they feel was compelling, interesting, outraging from the last week in the world of running or otherwise. And, we'll, uh, and then we're going to keep a tally overall of Wins and losses over the course of the weeks, months, and years that we do this ahead. Maybe we'll even rope in a few guest guest stars, guest panelists down the road. First topic. The Vaporfly 1%. A new study from some of the heavy hitters in the endurance sports uh, community, which has been released as a preprint, so keep that in mind. That doesn't mean, that means it's not been uh, peer-reviewed just yet indicates that elite marathoners from four of the majors in the last 10 year period reveal that yes indeed the nike shoe the super shoes the vapor fly four percent next percent alpha fly does indeed give runners a significant boost alex what do you think is the biggest takeaway from the study so People are going to read this study 
and come away with the hot take that's most present, I think almost in the title, that the shoes help women more than men. But hold up, it's a speed thing. It's not a gender thing. The best takeaway to me is the faster you are, the less these shoes help. So before the super shoes, so 2018 and before, the average time for a male top 50 finisher in I think the four major marathons they looked at, so Boston, New York, Chicago, and London, I believe it was, was 221.18. And the women, meanwhile, was 243.24. So keep that in mind. There's a 22-minute difference between the two. Now, after the shoes, so 2019, those average times in top 50 finishers from the same major marathons were 218 for the men and 239 for the women. So now a 21 minute difference. So you'd say, okay, women made the biggest jump. They're catching up because of the shoes, but not necessarily. It's that slower average finishing times in women that leads to greater improvements in women than in men. So here I'm looking at Shalea Kip. So she's a PhD candidate at UBC. She's an American runner. I think she went to the Olympics back in 2012. Mm -hmm. And she researches the effect of the shoes. We've seen her in studies like in the last couple of years. And she said there's at least two reasons for this, why the shoes benefit people who run slower. One is that the faster the runner, the less they can benefit from the shoes improving their running economy. Because in huh. theory, the faster you are, the better your economy already could be or probably is. A second reason is that faster moving objects encounter more air resistance than slower objects. So the faster the object, the more it's going to take to make it even faster. So overall, she said that it's likely that women seem to be benefiting more from the same percentage improvement in running economy as men, since they run at slightly slower speeds. So say, okay, here's an example. You're a dude who runs a three hour marathon and your wife just ran 250. Good news for you. The shoes will help you more, even if you're the guy. Oh, that sounds unfair almost. Mm. Andrew, what do you like most about this study? What do you think is... Um jumping out at you uh well first off alex valid points i i give you credit there um but the biggest takeaway for me was actually the the percentage improved by how much how much faster the runners actually got so the researchers looked at a group of over 200 runners uh, who ran the same marathon in 2018 and 2019 but in the 2019 marathon these runners were wearing the bite the vapor flies um and for this group they saw a 0.8% improvement with the men, while the women saw a 1.6% improvement. Huh. So for the men, that averages out to about a minute, 12 seconds of a faster marathon. The, the women, it's about three minutes, 42 seconds on average running faster. Um, but here's my big question. I, I mean, those are, those are big jumps, and there's no question that the, the vapor fly obviously helps. But where's the 4% improvement? I thought these things were called the Nike Vaporfly 4%, uh, if, I'm, if I'm not wrong. And I know the study says, within the study, there's a, there's a section that says the Vaporflies could potentially improve your running economy by 4%, whatever that means. Um, but speed-wise, you're likely to only improve by 1% to 2%, hence Michael's title at the beginning, the 1% Vaporflies. So what's up, Nike Marketing? Where's my 4% speed improvement? Valid points all around. Uh, so this begs the question, 2019 was seemingly the big year where there was the big shift. The uh, Nike shoe became uh, widely available to everyone from elites all around the world to recreational runners like us uh, poor working stiffs. Do you think that we need to put the old records in amber, and now uh, start a new series of post-Super Shoe era records. Alex, you first. No, I don't think you can do that. Because, well, then let's play this out. For the sake of fairness, we'd have to go back and segment history into eras based on every new technology that changes the game. So, like, we need to come up with records for, say, the Cinder Track era, the leather spikes era, the era when people thought cigarettes made you faster. A part of sport is the advancement. There was an era that where people thought cigarettes made you faster? I don't know, but it seems like everyone smoked them around the Bannister era. Bannister himself smoked cigarettes. Um, 
but yeah, it's like, okay, think about hockey, right? It's like the carbon hockey stick. People shoot harder now and it's part of the game. They're not trying to get rid of the stick because it's better in running. Now the shoes are just a step towards whatever's next. So last year, for example, Chepty guy and Guy day ran faster than anybody in the 5k and 10k because they had the help of the wave like pacing system, which is a whole new technology. And maybe in a few years, we come up with a new form of clothing that helps keep cool, like the speedo and swimming or a natural stimulant that works even better than caffeine, or someone finally figures out how to intermittent fast properly. And that's going to be the same thing all over again. So we would be complicating things way too much. We need to let just tech roll and keep the records on. Andrew, should we be, uh, casting off all the old records and uh, embracing this new era with new records starting at, I got to guess, 2019 or maybe even slightly earlier? Begrudgingly, I have to agree with Alex on this one. Um, mm. I think freezing the old records is a, a slippery slope. Um, I feel like next thing you know, if you go down that road, the track and field records are going to be equivalent to Guinness Book of World Records. I, I mean, where do we stop, right? We could suddenly have a record for the fastest 200 meters running ASIC spikes on a 200 meter track with 15 kilometer winds and temperatures hovering around 15 degrees Celsius. I, I worry that it could get very, very specific and obscure. Um, when I look at this though, I, I actually think track and field's problem stems from putting too much emphasis on times and records. Uh, I know that's kind of how we value performance in the sport, but if you look at other sports, you look at hockey, you look at basketball, you look at football, um, the entertainment of it is the, how the game is executed. Um, it's not about, you know, who scores the most goals is how you win the game, but it's not a, that's not a, a goal you're trying to achieve the same way in track and field you're trying to run a certain time. And it's also been acknowledged in those sports that, as kind of Alex mentioned as well, that the games are changing. That's why with new technology and stuff like that, that's why a lot of people say you can't compare Michael Jordan to LeBron James or Wayne Gretzky to Sidney Crosby. But in the track and field world, we continue to do that. We continue to compare current athletes to past athletes because of records. So we look at someone like Bridget Koskai, who, and we say, you know, she's a, a better marathoner than Paula Radcliffe because she broke Paula Radcliffe's record. And then people jump on that and they say, well, no, she had new technology and we, we get in a debate about it. Kind of similar to some of the other sports, but, but we have more of a measuring stick now. Um, and I also find it kind of funny that, that our concern is that people are getting too fast. Like to me, that's, that's what's exciting. We're continuing to push the boundaries and instead people kind of want to hold the records back. Um, so I think, I think to a certain degree, our fixation on, on comparing current athletes to past athletes and past times is, is actually holding the sport back a little bit. And I think if we want to extricate ourselves from these arguments, at least from a fan's perspective, obviously the, the pros still want to try and run certain times and run as fast as they can. Um, but I think we need to accept that the emphasis needs to shift more, shift more onto enjoying watching a well-executed race rather than having pacers try to hit fast times. Well said, well said. And with that, you jump out in front of the lead here, just in front of uh, Alex by a couple of points now. And that moves <laughs> us on to our next topic. Oh, and by the way, you can evaluate two different athletes from two different eras. Michael Jordan is better than LeBron James and always will be. <laughs> topic number two, Tokyo and COVID. The Olympics coming this summer, apparently they're going to happen, whether we want them to happen or not. And I think, you know, I'm split 50-50. I think you guys are as well. We want to see a great track meet, uh, but we want it to be done safely. The new COVID variant has hit Japan. Numbers in Tokyo are at all time are at an all-time high right now. Uh, guys, Japan's prime minister is saying, and the IOC is saying, that the Olympics are going to go ahead as scheduled this year. They will not be stopped by COVID. Question one, this is a straightforward one. Do you guys think that uh, the Olympics should happen this year from your perspective right now, Alex? I'm going with yes. You see, and as a preface, we always answer these questions with perhaps false assumption that COVID things won't get worse. So if things slowly improve, I say yes. And with the vaccine, we have reason to believe that they will. So I think they should happen. The four major sports right now are happening 
in North America, or they're on the verge of happening. And overseas, the Champions League in football, soccer is in full flight. So major races like London Marathon, they also happen without many repercussions. But so there's no real reason why the Olympics can't happen. But like with the London Marathon, you got to cut the fan experience. Olympics aren't about the fans at the end. It's about the athletes. And now our streaming services are so good and sophisticated that I bet that fans who were going to go will have a pretty good viewing experience at home. It won't compare, but they'll be able to watch. The reason I also think it should happen is the world does need a morale boost if we can do it safely. And who better to step out of their house and risk catching the virus than, well, the healthiest humans on the planet? Not sure how I feel about that last take, but uh, and I'm not sure how the healthiest humans in the fam- uh, planet would feel about that either. And we'll get to that in a second when we talk about athletes and immunization. But uh, Andrew, what's your take from your vantage point right now? The Olympics, yay or nay? Oh, it's gonna it's gonna be a hot take, but uh, I'm I'm saying no. I'm saying we don't need them this year. We like um, hot takes here. I think. If we look at the Olympics, I think if we look at the contemporary Olympics and what they are now, it's not what they initially set out to be. It's not looking at um, uh, showing the the potential of the of human limits. It's now the Olympics has kind of transformed into this form of entertainment where the athletes are secondary to the audience and it's more of a money maker for the IOC and the TV broadcasters rather than for a chance for the athletes to really succeed. I mean, if they were going to succeed, then they would be getting paid to do it, which they still aren't. Um, So, and I think this year in particular with the Olympics, sorry, last year, 2020, with the Olympics being canceled, it showed that we can have track and field without the Olympics and that it can still thrive and that we can still have solid races. Things like the marathon project where athletes get to still run fast um and they potentially make some money doing it and they have good opportunities and they can stay safe i look at the the olympics and yes the vaccine will improve things and hopefully by that point you know we'll have been able to vaccinate enough people that it'll be safe to do but at the same time the olympics is so much bigger than other sports going on right now it has 11,000 athletes from 206 nations and this is not contained in a bubble of north america the way the other sports are. This is going to be people coming from all over the world deciding to get together and compete while we're still trying to contest with the pandemic. So I say we can skip, we can skip this one. That is indeed a hot take, uh, which moves me on to IOC member and uh, former WADA boss, Dick Pound, the best name in all of sports, says that he thinks that Olympic athletes should be allowed to jump the vaccine queue so that the games can happen safely. Alex, do you agree that athletes should be able to cut the line this summer for the vaccine so that they can go play sports? Uh, Okay. As much as I want the Olympics to happen, like, no. So like I said, healthiest humans on the planet, they aren't the ones who need the vaccine, at least not right now. I understand that like if these people catch COVID and it ruins the event they've trained for for five years, it's frustrating. Like I can at least sympathize with that. But in a sense, it's kind of like avoiding an injury. You do your due diligence to stay healthy and say they do get the vaccine. Let's play it out and see what happens. The NHL now wants it. Then the NBA wants it. Then the Champions League wants it. Where do you draw the line? Either some pro athletes athletes are denied the vaccine and others aren't and that creates conflict among the elite or athletes everywhere get it and it creates conflict everywhere else people cry elitism and it's governmental suicide and it gets worse when see your grandmother catches covid and she can't fight it because her vaccine went to matt centrowitz there would be more losers than winners in the situation but man his ig of the of getting the vaccine would be so hot andrew uh, should we be giving athletes the shot and send them off into a uh, sporting battle for our entertainment this summer ahead of everybody else? <laughs> I, I just want to add to that, that last bit. I, I can almost guarantee Centrowitz will be getting the vaccine with no shirt on, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> it's like, we only no. need your arm. He's like, no, no, I got this. This was, he, he couldn't wait to show the nurses his veins on his arm. <laughs> 
These babies are pure. Um, I'm a I'm a no go as well. No way. I uh, I don't see the point of it. Um, this might be a bit of a stretch, but I as I said earlier, the Olympics, uh, from my perspective, is a form of entertainment. These athletes are are have worked you know their entire lives to get to where they are, and it's very impressive. But what they're doing is putting on a show for an audience. And with that mindset, I mean, as Alex kind of mentioned, where do you stop? Um, I mean, even if we go beyond sports, because sports, you know, are kind of our priority, but what about say, um, the Eurovision competition? Uh, and for those who don't know, it's a, it's a singing competition taken part in by, uh, European countries. Um, it's a big deal. I think, yeah, it's a big deal. It has millions of viewers every year. They submit their best singers every year and they compete. It's kind of like American Idol, but almost even bigger than that. Um, and so, you know, this brings entertainment and joy and a morale boost to people all across Europe. Is it worth that going on? Do we do we vaccinate all the, the top singers in every country as well so that we can keep that show going on? Because are they more important than the Olympics? Is the Olympics more important? How do you weigh that? How do you judge that? Um, how, how, so, yeah. how dare you put an, a Eurovision performer uh, competitor ahead of a dressage competitor? How dare you, Andrew? <laughs> Did you see Will Ferrell's performance? It was fire. It was very moving. <laughs> <laughs> All um, right. Uh, on to topic number three. Journeyman pro track runner and elite tweeter, Kyle Merber, is retiring. Merber just turned 30. Happy birthday, belated to you, Kyle Merber. So arguably he's at the peak of his distance running prowess. But he never realized his Olympic dream. Why do you think he's calling it quits now, Andrew? Well, you know, that, that article hit me hard. I am, I am also 30. And I am also, well, I retired quite a while ago. Um, and I'm also, you know, a good 30 seconds slower or so than Merber. But otherwise, I, I can really relate to the, <laughs> his retirement. Um, but there was a, a New York Times article published this past July about Merber and his attempts to make the U.S. Olympic team. And in it, Merber talks about how over the last few years, his mind has kind of started to wander during runs and workouts. He started to think more about job applications, starting a family rather than concentrating on, on intervals, which I think is, is pretty realistic. Um, being an elite track and field athlete is not a, a definitive career for your entire life right? It's, mm. it's almost, I hate to say it, but a bit of a postponement of, of reality because it's mm. not something you can do mm. at, you know, you can't compete at the top, top level where you're competing against the best in the world for your entire life. And you also don't make the kind of money in that sport that you would in say football, hockey, basketball, you're not making millions. I believe the, the New York times article was saying Merber essentially had enough money to travel and eat. Uh, and that was kind of what he was surviving off of. And so eventually you get to a point where if you've missed the U.S. Olympics team three times in a row, the sponsors stop calling and you're left with a bank account that's pretty similar to what you had in undergrad when you're just buying craft dinner to eat for dinner. So I, I think Merber kind of realized that, you know, track and field wasn't the only thing out there. I think he, he realized he gave it a good go and he wanted to focus on, on more than just running. He wanted to kind of expand into other aspects of life. Alex, uh, how's your craft dinner uh, storage at the apartment in, in Toronto? Is it good? I have one box left. We make craft dinner the week before I left, actually. By the way, ketchup or no ketchup? Me and my girlfriend have this this lasting argument about it. Oh, I'm a ketchup guy. No ketchup. No. 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 No ketchup. Oh. Do you like stir I'm it like, in? <laughs> yeah, she like mixes it up. Oh. And stuff, yeah. No, I can't do it either. I'm an, I'm a no strictly no catch travesty. Oh my <laughs> god. Okay. Yeah. Back to the show. Merber retiring. Do you think this is too soon? Why do you think he why do you think this is happening now? I think there had to be a breaking point aside from the reality that most runners face. Like I agree with Andrew, those are stressors, right? Lack of money, you want to start a family, you're getting older, but those were probably all things that Merber would have accepted years ago when he went on, decided to take on this journey of becoming a professional runner. There had to be a breaking point other than turning 30, which I hear Andrew is pretty brutal in itself. But I think it's two things. 
The first one is COVID. And the second one is maybe sadder in some ways. The COVID angle is, you know, there are fewer opportunities, uncertainty about future running events. And that I can understand, you know, it just feels like you have perhaps less to run for if some races get canceled. And two is kind of a more insidious thing. I've been talking about this a lot lately, actually, but it's the relationship between one's ability to self-promote and one's likelihood to get sponsored. Now, Merber mastered the game years ago. He had this YouTube series. It was a flow track. He had this video series called The Real Main, and it was fire. But the game has grown, and it's gotten younger. I think YouTube watchers are young. They like Ali Ostrander, Drew Hunter, Caillou. They don't necessarily know Merber. Those who grew up with Merber don't go on YouTube. They're too busy watching the news. <laughs> so maybe his marketability isn't so good anymore. Maybe brands are seeing that. And maybe that's partly why there are no top-notch pro opportunities for him. And by top-notch, I'm talking six-figure deals. Oh, that was devastating for somebody well over the age of 40, uh, 30. I'm, I'm <laughs> appalled, but also nodding my head for the most part. Which leads me to, uh, as you said, Alex, uh, He's got 16,000 followers on Twitter. He is kind of a little, he's a little bit of an, uh, an American legend on running Twitter. Uh, super respected guy, and he's really entertaining. He's kind of a brand marketer's dream, and yet he is walking away. What does this say about the middle class of the track world, Andrew? I like that we're, uh, we're imposing the idea of the, the class system on the track world. Although what concerns me is if Merber's considered middle class, then is there something lower than lower class? Because that's where I've been my whole life then. <laughs> but um, <laughs> I actually think that the direction track and field is taking is good for that, that middle class runner. The, the runners who are, are competing, say, at the Olympic trials and are, are running fast, but they're not quite making the teams. They're not the, the top of the top. I think with the Olympics being postponed in 2020, it showed us that track and field can, can go on for these guys, that we can have events, as I mentioned, like the marathon project, like some of the diamond league events, Chepta guys, world records happening. We, we can organize our own events and specifically something like the marathon project that's turning the spotlight onto these middle class runners, these middle of the, the crop runners who are still fighting for that shot at the Olympic trials or the Olympic uh, marathon, the Olympic team. Um, and they're not getting lost necessarily amongst the kind of marathon majors. They're not finishing, you know, five, 10 minutes back from an Elliot Kipchoge and not getting mentioned. They're finally getting a little bit of the spotlight and, and being shown that they're out there and, and maybe this will help with sponsorships and maybe prolong some of their careers. Alex, 16,000, uh, Twitter followers, I guess that didn't buy him enough. Uh, what does that say about the state of all of us with our uh, sixteen to 20,000 Instagram followers? By all of us, I mean not me. I was going to say, what? No. Uh, well, I think what we're missing first to answer the question is the following. What was Hoka paying Merber? We don't really know. Did he walk away because he was strapped for cash or – did he walk away because he wants to make more than say like $60,000 a year and sit, thinks he can make more in, in say the workforce best case it's the latter, but either way, I think we can assume he wasn't making the absolute big bucks. And I think what that says is the following. I think I'm going to disagree with Andrew. I think the miss, the middle class of running is kind of disappearing. You're either a world beater and you're well taken care of. I'm thinking of Kip Chogi, Emma Coburn, et cetera. Or you're an influencer runner who makes commission from fans and views. So then I'm thinking, say, the guys in Tin Man Elite. Depends how many views they're getting, how many, how much their, their sponsors are going to be engaged in what it is they're doing, and if they continue on supporting them. See if they get, say, hundreds of thousands of views. They'll keep supporting them. And if they get less views, they'll get less support. Or you're an ambassador. You make nothing. So Merber at one time was perhaps the most marketable sub-Olympic runner in the U.S., but without world beating times or very recent online relevance, it seems like even he couldn't hack it. And if he can't hack it, I, as a middle class runner, I, I don't think anyone can. Ooh, we'll leave it there uh, for now. But actually, 
we've got a fourth topic that is actually sort of fitting in all of this. Hold on a second, guys. A little bit of Canadian content here. We are, after all, all based in Canada, so we've got to check off the Canadian box every show. And this one is about 2021 future Olympian Trevor Hoffbauer, who has signed with Saucony. Speaking of middle, uh, shrinking middle class of running, Hoffbauer is sort of bringing the middle class back, I guess you could say. Uh, Andrew, what does this say about uh, about all of this? Why Saucony? Why now? I have to assume for Hoffbauer it was financial. Um, I mean, we know when when he ran his uh, Olympic qualifying time at the the Scotiabank Toronto Waterfront Marathon, he was wearing Nikes, uh, the Vaporflies, and we know he was unsponsored at that time. Yep. But to perform as an elite runner, one who's going to the Olympics, the biggest race of his life. And someone who, you know, probably needs the advantages he can get in order to compete there. Hofbauer needs some backing. Um, and there aren't really enough pain road races happening right now to try and squeak out a living. So my honest assumption is that Saucony kind of came knocking on the door. Possibly, very likely, they were the only ones who came knocking on the door. And Hofbauer was in a position where he just couldn't turn them down. Alex, why do you think that uh, Hoff the most jovial character in Canadian distance running uh, decided to go back to kind of a, a, a smaller brand. He used to be with New Balance and now he's, he's moved back to Saucony or moved to Saucony. Because it didn't work out with New Balance and probably like Andrew said, I don't think there was another option for him. Break it down in Canada. Adidas seems like it's more interested in just world beaters no offense to Hofbauer. And outside of Quebec and Canada, A6 has gone the way of the dodo. No offense to CPT. And Trevor's not a Nike guy. Like, to, to the core, Trevor's not a, a Nike guy. He's he's like a grassroots runner. He was it's, like a comp- village, it's like a compliment of village kind. that is. Sure. Yes, yeah, this, this is meant to be a compliment to Trevor. He was raised by, like... He's, he's a village guy. He's a community guy. He's not the no strip wearing superhuman who eats dry shreddies for breakfast and always forgets your name. See, to me, it was either Saucony or Hoka, like these community driven brands. And Saucony in particular has a history of supporting these community focused athletes with their ambassador programs, at least in Canada. They call them the Hurricanes. Now, Trevor works at a running store. He remembers your name when he sees you. He always remembers my name. It's nice. And he five he high fived his way out of a two thousand dollar time bonus at the I think it was twenty seventeen Canadian Marathon Championships. This is a great mm-hmm. YouTube clip, by the way. Oh, I think yeah, he had to run under two seventeen, but he was so excited that he was going down the home stretch winning that he had to high five all the fans and then went over the two seventeen mark and then lost two thousand dollars. Someone made a GoFundMe and then he made up more than two thousand dollars. Anyway, it's a fun story if you want to check out the YouTube video. And well, why Saucony? It works for on Trevor's side, it makes sense. Now Saucony's side, you know, for all its praise, it's probably just doing like other companies and capitalizing on these elite athletes when they're worth the most, right? This is an Olympic year after all. So I don't think it's a coincidence that they also signed Melindy Elmore this year either. But here's a bit of a behind the scenes with Saucony. Well, not really behind the scenes. I talked to Nate Brannon a while ago about this. Back in 2016, so this 1500 meter runner finished 10th at the Rio Olympics in 2016. And back in 2016, in December, his Saucony contract was not renewed despite his top 10 finish. That's right. They, back then, they reinvested in ambassadors and running store workers. So I just hope they don't pull the same stunt on Hoff. But from what I see in social media, it's a multi year deal, he says. So hopefully, there's a good few years of pay for him coming up. I believe, ironically, Nate Brandon ended up in Nike gear at the very end of his career. Uh, so it's a bit of a switch here. So question number two, Andrew. Shoe, the shoe wore landscape perhaps changing? Most definitely. Um, I mean, I think we even talked about that on our, our last podcast in terms of, you know, Adidas coming on strong at the end of the year and and kind of almost eclipsing Nike with uh, 
with the world half marathon record happening. But um, yeah, I think by this point here at the beginning of 2021, you look at every major shoe company and they have a carbon plated shoe now, even, even companies that you've barely heard of, like on running has a, a carbon plated shoe now and, and sponsored athletes. So I think athletes are willing to give it a go with companies outside of Nike. Um, I think if you looked, especially back in 2019, I've seen a few pictures of of marathons and it's just all vapor flies. And now I think we're starting to see a little bit more of a variety behind that. Um, and now I, I do question whether I, I agree with Alex. I think with Hofbauer, Saucony is a very good fit for him. I think it's, it probably is the right place, but I do question <laughs> this close to the Olympics, whether it's the right call. Um, I mean, I know there's been some tests. Melinda Elmore did uh, did kind of a test between the, the Saucony shoes and, and the Nike shoes to see which one came out on top. But I do wonder, with Hofbauer, it was Nike that took him to that, that 210 marathon that qualified him for the Olympics. And I question whether he should be messing with that formula. Maybe he should have should have stuck with the Nike shoes for it. Hot take coming in at the end there. We're going to give you one extra one for that, actually. <laughs> And you just jumped into the lead. I'm just doing the math here. Uh, looks like 43 to 42. So you're just ahead in the okay. lead here. It's a tight one so far. Alex, this is your opportunity. Do you think the shoe war landscape has changed by this little shift with one brand and one athlete? Uh, not with just this one shift, but I think in general it is changing. And to illustrate that, I'll, I'll throw in a, a Canadian example since we're on our CanCon uh, part. So I talked to a Canadian athlete a little while ago, Ev Nestling. Let's call him a – he's like on the cusp of a fast marathon. He's probably an Olympic hopeful perhaps for the next cycle and perhaps for this cycle if he runs fast this spring. I talked to him back in 2019. This is right when Esselink had just gone from a 64 to a 62-minute half marathoner with the help – of the next percent. So here's a guy who's in his late twenties at the time. He's unsponsored. Let's call him kind of scrap for cash. And he's shelling 339 bucks a pair to supplement history. Now, back then he said he would not dream to run in anything other than the Nikes, mm. even if another brand offered him a sponsorship and you know, fair enough back then in 2019, 31 out of the 36 podium finishers of the marathon major series or major marathon series wore Nike. And of course this year, if it wasn't for COVID, we would be even more aware how things change, but don't quite have the data this year. So Nike might still marginally be better. If I had to bet money on it, I probably would bet on Nike or Adidas, but not enough to make someone like Hofbauer refuse a sponsorship. Those scenarios like Esselink, I think happen less and less. And think of the latest race, the latest like large scale race, the marathon project, the winners, Sarah Hall, Marty Heher, were non Nikes. So this is the new reality. Others have caught up and that's a good thing. So now that runners are willing, I expect that there are going to be more deals like Hofbauer. So yeah, I think the landscape has changed. And with that, you caught up as well and you've jumped into the lead, a very, very tight race thus far. We're coming into the fifth and final topic of the day, Usain Bolt's new joint. The fastest human of all time has just released a new song called Living the Dream, which features the singer NJ and also uh, appears to be doing most, if not all, of the singing. Uh, let's take a little listen to this here. All right. <laughs> Andrew, first of all, do you think that Usain Bolt is going to make a successful transition into pop stardom? And is he even singing at all on this track? <laughs> um, can we first just stop? acknowledge that the the title of this song is living the dream i just feel like like what a time to to release this i, I just feel like there's there's worldwide suffering going on right now and <laughs> didn't think of that you're right he's talking about how he's living the dream but on that note I, I will say he's not actually talking about it because i am pretty certain he doesn't 
uh, sing, rap, even speak throughout any of the, the video. Um, correct me if I'm wrong on that. But so I do think he has a, a good shot at breaking into the, the pop scene, though. And, and to justify my point, I'm going to walk you guys through, through a little story here. So back in, in 2009, University of Toronto hosted a meet called the Festival of Excellence. Yep. And Usain Bolt happened to be the headliner of this meet. How they got him to come, I have no idea, but I assume it involved a lot of money. Involved, um, it involved $1 million of money. That was my impression, yeah. I, I also think as, a, as an added bonus, this might be why too, but I'm pretty sure at that time he was dating a girl who went to Ryerson University. Inside so, information. Uh, yeah, shout out to, uh, to Alex and, and I, to, to Rye High. Um, but the, the day before the race happened, the day before the Festival of Excellence, all the athletes were allowed into the stadium to do some last minute warming up on the track. Uh, and I happened to be allowed onto the track as well with some other University of Toronto Track Club athletes, and we were doing a workout on the track. And, you know, I thought I was, I was moving along pretty good, but obviously you're not really focused on the workout. You're watching what these other guys are doing. Um, and everyone was watching Usain Bolt. And I, I distinctly remember this, that there was a girl with the, the University of Toronto Track Club who was having a rough day, rough workout, and she was sitting at the side of the track with her head in a garbage can puking, just having a rough go. And Usain Bolt walked past her didn't acknowledge her, but as he was walking by, he just started rapping, let it out, let it out, let it out. <laughs> I don't know whether to award you points or not. I'm going to give them to you. I'm going to give you a couple of them because that's that's definitely inside information. Yeah. And to this day, I think I will remember that till the day I, the day I die. So I think, you know, I saw a little bit of his rapping take place there. And I think he, I think he has potential. He was working on it early on, even when during his running career. Hold on. You, you've undersold this, but let's just get this on the record. You were working out on the track at the same time as Usain Bolt? I was, yes. <laughs> that gives you a couple of points for sure. Oh, that's not fair. I was 14 years old in 09. Oh, well, you should have <laughs> been a faster 14-year-old, my friend. <laughs> Alex. Uh, do you think that uh, do you think that Bolt's got a future in music and and is he performing on this song? Did you do a a, a forensic analysis? I saw him lip sync a couple times. Like when the main artist NJ actually goes into more spoken word, less melody. I've seen you saying just kind of like mimic his mouth movements and like dance a little bit. So I'll call it like. He's there. He's the prop. What I'm noticing, it's he's definitely a prop of the other guy. This is this is NJ's doing. It wasn't Bolt's idea. I think this is NJ's doing. Totally. Um, but can he break in? No, he okay. This will not get him to break in. With this song, he missed his opportunity. Because that song is like short. There was room for a rap bridge, and he totally squandered it. So okay. Agreed. Ever watch a Lil Wayne music video, okay, where he comes in after the second chorus to rap the bridge? Like, he's always there next to the singer, like sometimes Tyga, sometimes Chris Brown, and then he hops in. So I thought Bolt was going to do the same. Then he disappointed when he didn't. So whether or not he can become a star, I don't know, but I got to hear the guy sing. Maybe he can sing. Maybe he can rap. This didn't count. He's just hanging out next to NJ, who's definitely just his buddy. So get him really on a track. If it's bad it goes viral. It's fun. It dies there, whatever. And if he's not bad, then he kind of gets to feature on some high profile tracks, like kind of makes it a recurring thing and kind of makes it as a notorious star. Like if you remember uh, Marcus Stroman used to pitch with the Blue Jays, he got into the rap game a little bit and he had an edge because people already knew who he was. And think about Bolt, he has way more star power. If he wants to rap with Drake, he can rap with Drake, even if he's like, just okay. But anyway. I think I think a Drake I think Drake just avoids that like he just ghosts him on that one. He's just like, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I still need to see the Drake and Bieber collab before we see the Drake Bolt collab. But if anyone ends up listening to this podcast who's in the joint running in music industry, which is huge, I think they should make a song about passing the torch with a few sprinters. Get like. Justin Gatlin lip sync the chorus. Say he pays childish Gambino under the table and doesn't tell anyone. Bolt has verse one and two, and Noah Lyles, who also raps, has a SoundCloud. 
comes in at the end. Instant hit. It's just <laughs> you've got the deep knowledge on the the on 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 music theory and the cross section, the Venn diagram between hip hop culture and track culture. One more thing: anyone has to look at Ricky Roxford on YouTube. It's Eric Jenkins, and he used to rap when he was younger. Oh my god, that's that's a must listen to, must see. <laughs> I can't even imagine what that's like. You probably can't imagine exactly what it's like. I think I can. You're right. Uh, Bolt is the still the fastest man in the world, uh, and it lets him get away with campy bullshit like this. But do you? But with young sprinters coming up, do you think there's a chance that? he kind of lapses into irrelevance, especially if somebody gets really close to those times. I, Andrew. Uh, yeah, I'm going to gonna throw in another hot take here. I think give it 20 to 30 years and Bolt will be irrelevant. I, I can see that, uh, that he was very much so ahead of his time. You know, his, his world records in the 100 and 200 are, are unbelievable. And from a, Human mechanics standpoint, I don't think they'll be rivaled for a while, 20 to 30 years. Um, and I think he will be remembered for how dominant he is. I, I will give him that the same way kind of a, a Michael Phelps is. But I, I don't think that track and field has the same pull as other sports, the same pull as, say, basketball or hockey. Um, and I don't think he's going to be remembered the way some of those greats will be remembered. Um, it, I, yeah, I, I mean, I think of some other guys, which like a, a Donovan Bailey, for instance, who's, who's still hopping around. And I admit he wasn't nearly as dominant as, uh, as Bolt, but you know, now he's a, uh, he's a commentator on CBC. So he's, he's still involved in the sport, but I don't think, you know, kids coming up necessarily think of Donovan Bailey and, and go wild over him the way we kind of respect Bolt right now. Poor Donovan. Um, but I, I think, yeah, give it, give it a few years, a, a decade or two, and I think some young kid is going to come up and break one of his world records. I, really? I think probably the 200 before the 100. But I, I just look at the talent that is coming up, you know, uh, like a Noah Lyles, for instance, like Alex mentioned. Um, and, and I also think you have to factor in the technology that's, that's coming into play. We, we look at this past year, the past two years, with Joshua Cheptegei, with Bridget Koskei, these are runners who took down world records that we thought were absolutely untouchable, who, who broke uh, Bekele's record, who broke Paula Radcliffe's marathon record, you know, records that hadn't been touched in years. Um, and I, I honestly think that eventually spike technology and track surfaces and genetics, frankly, is going to catch up to Bolt and his records are going to be broken and he's going to kind of fade off into irrelevance. Uh, some some scorchers there at the end coming coming in with some fury andrew you want to win this alex it's your last chance man it's the last question yeah, what do you think I'm gonna, have to, I'm gonna have to disagree i don't think bolt's getting forgotten i think he's achieved mj status gretzky status when you make it into the pantheon of generation defining athletes you're never forgotten he's gonna die a legend and that's because of a just the height of his performances and also the longevity. You know, he's won several Olympic gold medals, rarely been beaten. He was a threat in 2008 as much as he was a threat, you know, just a few years ago. And the longevity of it, I think, is somewhat rare in sprinting because you will have people, well, <laughs> frankly, in sprinting, you'll have people taking breaks because they've doped. Like, look at most other top athletes. And they've had to take breaks from the sports and they were found guilty of doping. And this is a guy who has beaten people who were dirty. Now, I understand and I know that all that I say gets negated if Bolt ever gets caught. But I like to assume that he's, you know, innocent until proven guilty. But here's the funny thing as to why Bolt is going to be remembered, too. is He's got an extra quality that MJ and Gretzky kind of don't. Like, Jordan and Gretzky have taken on the role of noble, like stoic ambassador who smoke a lot of cigars, but otherwise are pretty resigned and they'll show up to award ceremonies. And the last dance was pretty great. I'll give it that. But these people are pretty stagnant. Bolt could be remembered by doing just that and kind of fading off into the distance and letting his good times speak for themselves. 
but instead he's choosing to slowly become like Dennis Rodman. He's in clubs. <laughs> he's making music. I, I give him five years. He's going to have his hair dyed red. So <laughs> not only is he going to be remembered for a really good track career, but he's like got personality up the wazoo and that's not going to stop. That is fair enough. Uh, I would say the Rodman, the Rodman uh, reference, the uh, the Rodman comparison, the comp there to the fastest man of all time is a fascinating way to end this competition for this day. And unfortunately, Alex Sear, it didn't quite get you over the finish line. No. Today's winner is Andrew Cruikshank. So, Andrew, what do you win? A new car? No, no, you don't win a new car. You don't even win a used car. You win the opportunity to tell us, to talk even longer. Tell us something that you found fascinating, exciting, interesting, outraging in the world of distance running track and field or just please anything else if you want. All right. I I feel a little fraudulent or, or almost unprepared to, to speak about this, but I think the three of us can probably agree that the most pressing topic that, that needs to be addressed right now is, is kind of what's going on in the, the United States. I, mm-hmm. I don't think we can, can go by without, uh, without acknowledging that, um, how the, uh, the Capitol was, was recently stormed by, uh, by Trump supporters. Um, and I believe five people died during it. Uh, and, you know, it was a, a threat to the, American democracy, but thankfully Biden has been sworn in and, and will take office in January 20th, I believe. Uh, and I think certainly people need to, to step forward and, and um, kind of take responsibility for this. Uh, one person in particular needs to. But mm. I, I also think it's a, it's a good opportunity to, um, to remind people that uh, we shouldn't let anger breed anger here. Um, I think this this isn't the time to to draw a line in the sand and, and cast people out. Uh, without a doubt, what happened was wrong, but um, I don't think the right the right solution is to respond with anger. I think we need to work towards more more understanding and, and move past this. So uh, I hope our our American listeners and and uh, everyone down south is is doing all right. Well said, Andrew. Well said. And uh, yeah, it's a a ridiculous and upsetting and scary situation. And uh, glad you brought it up. Uh, all right, guys. That was episode number one of the XC Top 5 show. Obviously, tell us uh, how we did, what you thought of the whole thing, uh, whether you enjoyed it or not at us the xc org on twitter let us know slip into our dms on instagram if you so desire and tell us what you thought about it uh and uh obviously follow our youtube channel because we're going to be pushing this out as a youtube video as well uh just search the xc and it's going to pop up there and uh, we're going to be putting this out on instagram weekly as well on igtv um we've got some flashy effects there's a visual element to all of this, so it's definitely worth, I'd say, watching. And, and obviously, if you can't, give it a listen, because uh, we're going to keep it as a podcast as well. Congratulations, Andrew. You are one and zero. Alex Sear, better luck next time, big guy. Thanks very much, guys. <laughs>